Okay, well now, now today I'm going to discuss with you data communication networking, a lecture under multiplexing and spreading. Now let's look at uh, what we need to consider in this today's lecture. Okay, as you consider multiplexing and spreading, you must understand that this is a very important aspect in data communication networking, which can help most of the, the computers and the users to share the data because the purpose of this is about sharing. My dear, you have so now, let's look at uh, multiplexing itself. What is multiplexing? Multiplexing basically is about splitting the channel, the, the channel into multiple components that can carry data and able to receive or reach many users without difficulties. So whenever the bandwidth or the medium linking two devices is greater than the bandwidth needs of the device, the link can be shared. Right, as you can see from the diagram here, if you have so many users to receive the message uh, simultaneously, so instead of using dedicated lines to send data, the principle of multiplexing can be used because this principle promotes sharing of the media. <clears throat> so then, multiplexing is a set of techniques that allows the instantaneous transmission of multiple signals across a data line. As data and telecommunication use okay, increases, so does the traffic. So in new life, we have links with limited bandwidth. So bandwidth utilization is a wise use of available bandwidth to achieve specific goals. So because of this, we need to make use of the available bandwidth to achieve so many things. And that's what we call efficiency. Because basically efficiency is the ability to use less resources to produce more. So efficiency can be achieved by more flexible. Use a shared media that will carry multiple uh, signals that will flow in it and able to be given to multiple users on the other side. So this diagram below here before indicates or explains what multiplexing in principle format is. You have so many input lines and you expect to have so many output lines on this side. So the multiplexer will endeavor to combine okay, these input lines or signals into one channel which on the receiving side, there's a demultiplexer that splits this combined signal into respective what? Respective channels. Okay. So there are three basic multiplexing channels, that is frequency division multiplexing, wave division multiplexing, and time division multiplexing. The first two are technical design, or they are techniques designed for analog, and the third, a technique designed for signal. What does it mean? Check the diagram here. This is multiplexing, and these are the categories of what? Multiplexing. So what we are saying is, if you look at the first two, that is frequency division multiplexing and wave division multiplexing, these are analog. They are good for analog signals. Whereas time division multiplexing is good for digital transmission. So in our text system, the number of lines, okay, share the bandwidth of one link. So the lines on the left, okay, direct their transmission streams to the marks or multiplex that want. We are talking about these lines on the left to direct their channels to the marks, which we simply call in full multiplex. So which combines them into a single stream, many to one. As you can see here, there are so many channels that are combined through this link. So after the receiving end, the stream, okay, the stream is fed into the demultiplex, the DMAX, this one, which separates the stream back into its component transmissions, that is one to many, and directs them to their corresponding what? Clients. So basically, multiplexer does not work alone, it works with the demultiplexer so that the inputs, okay, the lines that have been inputted which are combined in this channel can be split according to the respective white lines. 
So the figure below, the weight link refers to a physical part, okay? The weight channel refers to the portion of link that carries the transmission between a given pair of lines. So one link can have many channels, as you can see from the diagram here. All right. Now let's look at frequency division and flexi. Is the analog technique that can be applied when the bandwidth of a link, okay, measured in hertz, is greater than the combined bandwidth of the signals to be transmitted? True. Sure. So in FDM, signals generated by each sending device modulates different harder frequencies. These modulated signals are then combined into a signal opposite signal that can be transported by the link. So as you can see from the diagram, what you're saying is these, okay, these analog signals, which comes before they are taken into a shared link, they are converted into a form that can be transmitted in the respective link. Right, so basically expecting that this will be taken into frequency, okay, modulation, as you can see here, okay, as opposed to the way it is. Maybe this is just a signal carrying data, but it will be converted into frequency modulation. Okay, so the carrier frequencies are separated by the sufficient bandwidth to accommodate these modulated signals. When you say modulated signals, it's just a means of making the computer understand what the data means or what the data is for. Because when you modulate frequency, that has an interpretation okay, on the receiving side. If you change the frequency size, maybe that can mean you're sending a one. If you shorten the frequency, it means maybe you're sending zero. So if you are sending certain words or the data, the data is converted into binaries. So the wave will be controlled according to the ones and zeros so that it can be interpreted on the other side. So people, that's what it means to say modulated frequency. A modulated frequency is a frequency that carries data. Okay? So channels can be separated by strips of unused bandwidth to the guard band to prevent signal from overlapping. When you say guard band, it's just the space that is there between the frequencies because if the the guard or okay, the space is very small interference do occur so to avoid interference you find that the guard space is actually enough to avoid interference that's what this is in addition the cutter frequency must not interfere with the original data frequencies because of these guard bands which have been calibrated or measured well to ensure that there is no signal overlapping. So what we're saying is if these signals are converted into some modulated frequency, yes, before they get into a link, they must you must ensure that there's enough guard space between the signals so that they won't interfere. That's what this means, the guard bands. Okay. So the demultiplexer uses a series of filters to decompose the multiplex signal into its uh, or student component signals, which means, yes, the multiplexer will do the opposite of what multiplexer was doing. So to get these, uh, the, the frequency that is combined, okay, to filter this link into some individual frequencies, which are interpreted by the demodulator according to the frequency modulation that has been used. Then it will be given out the way it came. And that's how the data works. It does the opposite of what the multiplex does. Okay, for example, five channels such, okay, with each with 100 kilohertz bandwidth are to be multiplexed together. What is the minimum bandwidth of the link if there's a, if a need for a guard band of 10 kilohertz between the channels to prevent interference? Look at this question. So the solution is. For five channels, we need at least four guard bands, right? Four guard bands for five channels. This means that the required bandwidth is at least five times 100 plus four times 10, which is 540. So this five channel and each one is 
is actually 100 kilohertz. That's how come you're saying five times 100 kilohertz. And then we need four channels. So it's four, what's the allocation for the guard space is 10. So we're saying four times 10. So the channels, they have to be accompanied by the guard space. So at this 40 you're seeing here is going to sort out the interference levels. Otherwise the actual transmission is 500 kilohertz because each one is 100 kilohertz. So when you send 500 kilohertz, this type of signal transmission is going to be highly interfered, right? So now to prevent that interference, that's how come you're providing this particular hands to ensure that data is transmitted accordingly. Okay, this is what the diagram here is trying to explain what this example is all about. So these spaces in between, we call them the guard space. Right, so this is how you compute such an arrangement. Right. Now let's move on to wavelength division of flexing. WBS. Wavelength division of flexing. WBX is designed. Okay, this one is basically designed to use the high data rate capability of fiber optic cable. So the fiber, okay, the optic fiber data rate is higher than the data rate of metallic transmission cable. So using a fiber optic cable for one signal line waste the available, the available bandwidth, which is true for all the cases in terms of sharing. So because of this, multiplexing allows us to combine several lines into one. This principle is not strange. And we have talked about it even in the previous one. The previous one takes the network, right? So the W, okay, DM, which is the wave division of flexing, is also analog, just like frequency division. Uh, this technique combines optical signals as opposed to, okay, the frequency, and just the frequency in the signals. So the combining and the splitting of light sources are easily handled by prism. Remember this in physics, okay, it splits light. So recall from the basic physics, as I mentioned, eh? prism bends a beam of light based on the angle of incidence and the frequency. That's what the prism is, bends, as opposed to splitting, as I mentioned. So it bends. So as you can see, these, okay, these uh, frequencies we are seeing here are bent, converged into one. Okay, they come into one like that. And then the opposite, if you turn the prism, it's going to split according to the angle splitting, as you can see, according to this. So the technique is very simple. So turn the prism to where it is, where it is actually flat. And then towards where it is sharp, that's where the combination takes place. As you can see, it is flat here, it's sharp here, so the, the signals will come to one like this, right? Then as they move on this shared link, again, to do the opposite, where it is sharp, okay, it means it's going to split according to where it is flat, like this. That's how it works. That's a principle, the basic principle of physics that is applied in the wave division on flex. But the principle still remains the same. So using this technique, the multiplexer can be made to combine several input beams of light, each containing a narrow band of frequencies into one output beam of wider, band of frequencies. So a multiplexer can also be made to reverse the process as Ada mentioned that you do the opposite of the other. So this one is the opposite of the other so that they can cancel each other. So one application of wave division multiplexing is the sonnet network in which multiple optic fiber lines are multiplexed and multiplexed. So a new method called dense Okay, wave division multiplexing can multiplex a very large number of channels by spacing channels very close to one another. So this achieves even greater efficiency. Remember, efficiency, the ability to use less resources to produce more. So use less resources such as the, the devices for splitting or combining if 
They are modified a little bit to have a sharper angle. They can actually combine so many signals and split so many signals. Right. That is not a problem. People, let's move on to time division multiplexing. Time division multiplexing as area on is a digital process that allows several connections to share the high bandwidth of the link. With a digital connection, you actually deal with the ones and zeros. These ones and zeros are highly interfered, so care is required for this type of technique to work without problems. So instead of sharing a portion of bandwidth as in FDM, time is shared. Interesting. Okay, as opposed to the portion of, okay, the bandwidth in sharing the portion of bandwidth in FDM. In this case, what is being shared is time. So each connection occupies a portion of time in the link. Not the same link is used as in FDM here. However, the link is shown sectioned by time rather than the frequency. In the figure, you see that signal one, two, three, and four occupies the link sequential. The TDM is a digital multiplexing technique for combining several row rate channels into one high rate, uh, right, or rather one channel. So if you look at these, the one, two, three, four, the digital signals come in here, they'll use one channel, but these channels, okay, are differentiated by time. They're given time slots. Right? That's what differentiates these. So even the demultiplexing would will split according to the time source given to the signal. That's what it means. So the secret here is about sharing time as opposed to just the frequency and the channel. Okay. So can we divide TDM into two? Okay. Yes, it can be done. We can divide TDM into two different scales, that is synchronous and statistical. So in the synchronous TDM, each input connection has an allotment in the output, even if it is not sending data. What does it mean? Let's look at this next part, time slots and frames. In the synchronous TDM, rather synchronous, the word synchronous means agreement, doing things Okay, in order and by arrangement. That's what we call synchronous. So expect some order here, some agreement of some sort as we handle the synchronous TDM. So the data flow of each input connection is divided into units where each input occupies one time slot. All right? So a unit can be maybe, for example, one bit, one character, or a block of data. So each input becomes one output unit right and occupies one output time slot so if i locate one input to a specific time slot it will be also be assigned to a specific output slot as it goes out so that we there is no confusion in terms of the multiplexing that's why it is called synchronous so there's some agreement so on the input time slot should agree with the output time slot. That's what this means, right? However, the duration of the output time slot is times shorter than the division, I mean, the duration of the input time slot, right? So if the input time slot is T, for example, the output time slot is after T. So where N is the number of connections. So in other ways, what you're saying is, Unit in the output connection as the shorter duration, it travels faster in the output. So when your output is shorter as opposed to the input that is getting in, of course it's logic because there will be some delays because there'll be so many times was given to so many channels. So when it's getting in slow, it's going out is faster. So in synchronous TDM, the data rate of the link, which is probably n times faster, than the unit duration, which is 10 times shorter. That's what this diagram was trying to explain. Okay, when well, these channels are given different time slots, but when they get in, they are a bit slow, okay, because they are sharing this with time differences. When they come out, of course, they'll be a bit faster. And this is trying to 
explain. Okay, so I just explain what I've talked about. Okay, uh, without difficulties. So this is this course is called interleaving, which is the, the same term that explains what synchronization is about. Agreement. Now we have uh, looked at empty slots. We have just considered interleaving. Okay, which is what you're seeing there. What about empty slots? So in synchronous TDM, okay, it is not as efficient as it could be. If a resource does not have data to send, the corresponding slot in the output frame is empty. So if there is no data to send, of course, the output frame will be empty. So it is empty, so expect even the output to be what? To be empty. So the empty slots, they are not just left in blank, they are given now data or a so-called empty data. Just like in computing, even spaces we have between characters, they are actually counted for. So there's nothing that is left to computer technique. So this, look at this example. Okay, so you're saying four channels are flexed using the, the TDM. If each channel sends 100 bytes per second, we multiplex one byte per channel. Show the frame traveling on the link, and the size of the frame, the duration of the frame, and the frame rate, and the rate bit for the link. Okay, so from the diagram that you're able to see, okay, each frame carries one byte for each channel. All right, these are bytes, 100 bytes that we are, we are trying to link. Okay, so the size of each frame, therefore, is four bytes. Okay, the size of each frame. Yeah, is what? Four bytes. Or 32 bits if you want. Why? Because each channel okay, is sent in 100 bytes and the frame card is one byte for each channel. So the frame rate must be 100 frames per second according to this computation here. So therefore, the bit rate is 100 times 32. Why 32? Because each byte is 32. So expecting 100 times 32 to get what? 3200 bits per, bits per second. Okay, very simple. Just try to understand the, the bytes, okay, and the bits in the byte, and try to understand how many frames will be carrying the data, right? Because a frame is a 32 bit, okay? So we can see the computation that we can get here. Example, okay, a multiplexer combines 400 kilobits per second channel using the times of two bits. Show the output with four arbitrary inputs. What is the frame rate? What is the frame duration? What is the bit rate? And what is the bit duration? Again, okay, as you can see from this data here, right, the link carries 50,000 frames per second. So the frame duration is there for one over 50,000 or 20, okay? The frame rate is 50,000 frame per second and each frame card is eight bit. So therefore, in terms of bit, we multiply 50,000 times eight, which will be one, 400,000 bits or 400 kilobits per second. So the bit duration, you divide one over 400 bits per second and you get this. This is how the, the transmission will be done. All right. So data rate management. One problem with TDM is how to handle a disparity in the input rate or the data rates. In our discussion so far, we have assumed that the data rates of all input lines were the same. However, if data rates are not the same, three strategies or combinations of them can be used. We can call these three categories multi-level multiplexing or multi-slot allocation or pause stacking rather. So in multi-level multiplexing, right, which is a technique used when the data rate of an input is multiple or other, which we can see from the diagram here that one data rate is okay, is more than one. So you need a multi-level multiplexing to have a single line which will go together with the other lines. So the, the first two input lines can be multiplexed together to provide the data equal to the 
other three. So these are coming more flex together into 40 kilobits per second so that they can go together with this into the 160 kilobit per second as you can see from the data. Right? So now the mode slot allocation, right? Sometimes it is more difficult to allocate more than one slot in a frame to a single input line. For example, we might have an input line that has the data rate that is multiple and another words input. In the figure, the input lines 50 kilobit per second data rate can be given two slots in the output. We insert a pseudo to parallel converter in the line to convert two inputs of one. Yes, this so this one, okay, this one here, as you can see, it is given additional pseudo to parallel converter, so it can split this, okay, as we consider the stuff in here, which is also very efficient corresponding to what we are looking at here, this problem. So the post staffing sometimes, the bitrate of the source are not multiple integers of each other. Okay, so therefore, neither of the above techniques can be applied, yes. One solution to it is to make the highest input data rate, the dominant data rate and then add dummy bits to the input lines with lower rates. This will increase their rates. This technique is called pause stuffing, bit padding or bit stuffing. Additional group, other bits to make it complete. So the input with the data rate of 46 is pause stuffed to increase the rate of 50 kilobit per second. All right. So now multiplexing can take place without difference. So this whole thing it is an algorithm or a suite of that helps programmers who puts these codes, okay, embedded codes in these machines to sort out these problems of multiple slots and multi-level multiplexing, as you can see, how to sort it out. Okay, now let's look at frame synchronizing. Synchronization between the multiplex and the demultiplexer is a major issue, right? Multiplexer and the multiplex are not synchronized. Interesting. So a bit belonging to one channel may be received by a wrong channel. Well, there's no synchronization, no understanding. So this reason, one or more synchronization bits are usually added to the beginning of each frame. These bits called framing bits follow a pattern frame to frame that allows the multiplexer to synchronize with the incoming stream so that it can separate the time slots accurately. Okay, so in most cases, this synchronization information consists of one bit per frame, alternating between one and zero. So the main objective is to avoid confusion so that the multiplexer can able to tell clearly what it is going to split, as opposed to splitting wrong signals, which can then or distort the whole purpose of sharing the channel. Now let's talk about statistical time division multiplexing. We're done with the synchronization. As we saw in the previous section, the synchronization TDM each input has a reserved slot in the output frame. This can be efficient if some input lines have not data to send. In statistical time division multiplexing, slots are dynamically allocated to improve bandwidth efficiency. So only when an input line has a slot worth of the data to send, is it given a slot in the output frame. In statistical multiplexing, the number of slots in each frame is less than the number of input lines. Therefore, the multiplexer checks each input line in round robin fashion. It allocates a slot for the input line if the line has data to send, otherwise it skips the line and checks the next line. Right. So addressing, we find that an input slot in a synchronous, or so rather synchronous TDM, is totally occupied by the data. But in statistical TDM, a slot needs to carry 
data as well as the address of the destination. That's the difference here. That's the difference. Not just the time slots, which corresponds to the output slot. But with this one, we are giving the addresses to these data that are restricting so they can be identified uniquely when they go to the demand flex. So in a synchronous TDM, I mean synchronous TDM, there is, a, there is no need for addressing synchronization and pre-assigned relationship between the input and the output saves an address. That is the input time slots corresponds to the output time slots that works well, okay, which we are referring to in statistical time division and addressing. So in statistical multiplexing, there's no fixed relationship between input and output, but we have pre-assigned or reserved slots which save that what? Addresses for easy identification. Okay, so slot size. Since a slot carries both data and an address in a statistical TDM, the ratio of the data size to address size must be reasonable to make transmission efficient. For example, it will be inefficient to send one bit per slot as data when the address is three bits. In statistical TDM, a block of data is usually many bytes while the address is just a few bytes. It's just the address as we compare to the data. So no synchronization of bits is actually needed in the statistical what? analysis. So bandwidth in the statistical TDM, the capacity of line is normally less than the sum of the capacity of the channel. So the designers of statistical TDM defines the capacity of the line based on the statistics of load for each channel. So if the average only X percent of the inputs force are filled, which means the capacity of the link affects this. Of course, during peak time, some slots need to wait. So we have so far looked at uh, multiplexing and spreading and we have seen the importance of these two. 